All right. Welcome everyone to go to Market Advisors Roundtable discussion on fortune telling or forecasting. I am your co-host, Elizabeth Italiano, and I'm a managing partner at GoToMarket Advisors, and I'll pass it over to my colleague to introduce herself as well. Hi, everybody. My name is Indu. I'm the managing director here at GTMA Advisors, and I lead up the sales practice at our company. Thanks, Indu. All right. Today, we are going to be talking with our expert panel about improving forecasting accuracy and how to leverage revenue intelligence tools like Gong. It's been a really hot topic this year, and that's because a lot of revenue leaders are struggling with their forecast process and in providing an overall accurate forecast. And if you've been in the hot seat, you know that this creates really stressful one-on-ones and sometimes, and unfortunately, embarrassing board meetings. And even though forecasts are often used to make important business decisions, revenue leaders are still struggling with this consistency and accuracy month after month and quarter after quarter. In fact, we actually had a very hard time finding panelists who felt comfortable enough talking about forecasting because of the struggles that they faced themselves. A number of panelists that we talked to or people that we talked to said, you know what, Liz, Indu would love to come on as a panelist, but anything on revenue except for forecasting. Um, so we are very fortunate that we have this amazing panel that are experts in forecasting who we will introduce in a few moments. So, Indu, we've seen this a lot, and by this I mean inaccurate forecasting, struggles with forecasting over the past year, and it's something that we can relate to from our days of being operational revenue leaders as well. Oh, absolutely. Like, I myself have had the embarrassing moments of forecasting a certain number for a board, for an exec team, and realizing that one swing deal that was going to get me to that number is now in the next quarter. How about you, Liz? Yeah, I felt this pain um, a number of times um, in the earlier days of my career, for sure. So for me, it was providing accurate forecasts for churn and expansion revenue. So whether it was missing my renewal forecast because of surprise churn and not forecasting that correctly or not closing on an expansion deal, um, you know, that was really stressful. However, we've learned from our experiences and mistakes as have our panelists. So we're here to share tips and tricks and our knowledge um, to help everyone become better at forecasting. So on that note, let's get to the introductions and meet our panel who, like I said, are proven experts in forecast accuracy. Dan, how about we start with you? Sure, thanks so much. Hi everyone, I'm Dan Whistler. I have been in various um, SaaS sales and customer success leadership roles for uh, more than 10 years now. And um, right now I just began at a company called WorkLeap. Prior to that, I led new business and cross-sell functions at Shopify. And before that was at a company called Achievers, which went from Sequoia-backed VC private um, to publicly traded and then private equity-backed private again. So um, seen kind of all iterations of ownership and sold um, very fast transactional products, as well as those longer term enterprise multi-year SaaS license fees. So I understand both the pain of over and under forecasting very, very well, um, and generally kind of see my, my forecast as a bit of my resume in sales. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, and as you heard from his experience, um, he's touched on all uh, spectrums of the revenue release. So um, he'll provide some great uh, insights. So whether you're a sales or a CS leader, um, post-sales revenue leader, um, I'm sure we'll get some great insights from Dan. Um, so Chuck, how about you? Hey, Liz, unmute. Yeah. <laughs> all right, there we go. Love technology. So my <laughs> name is Chuck Marcolier. Um, I've been the VP of uh, sales enablement. I've had a 30 year career in sales, sales leadership and sales enablement. Uh, my passion has really been around pre IPO uh, SaaS companies for the last five. And uh, when it comes to forecasting, oh, isn't that the crystal ball? Um, mm -hmm. Trying to get people. And I, I think the hardest thing about forecasting really is around, you know, it's, it's out of our control as sellers, but it's really for us to try to learn to listen and develop the skill trying to figure out, you know, the mind of the buyer or listen for the clues for the buyer. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But as the enablement side is how do we crack the nut and teach our sellers um, the clues to listen for, the questions to ask, 
and develop that skill or that checklist to know uh, and to discern what we're hearing to be able to give that accurate number. Great. All right. Well, uh, sounds like you have some great insight that you're going to share throughout the uh, roundtable. Um, so thanks for joining us, Chuck. And Pete, over to you. Yes, uh, I'll express a similar thank you. Appreciate everybody joining. My name is Pete Sibley. I'm the director of mid-market sales here at Gong. So I forecast for quite a large business group. Uh, I also lead our revenue leadership boot camp with a particular emphasis on how to run a world-class forecast uh, and drive predictability in your business. So uh, albeit my forecast is still not 100% accurate, it's getting much better. And uh, I try to scale that through our company. Before Gong, I, I was at a company called Classy for almost seven years. Uh, I was the VP of sales. So I forecasted at a third line level. Uh, it was a complex forecast that required uh, uh, a unit forecast, a volume forecast, and some other sticky pieces, which uh, was painful, but uh, made me much better at my craft. So excited to chat with you all today. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, thanks for joining us, Pete. Um, and really excited to have your forecasting expertise as well as your um, expertise on Gong and, and how to leverage a, a revenue intelligence tool. So Samantha, how about you? Hi, my name is Samantha. I'm an account executive at Gong. I actually work underneath Pete and he picks apart my forecast with Gong <laughs> Forecast. So I can speak to kind of the end user level. Uh, I've been at Gong for almost three years now back in the new business side of the house. But before then, I helped take our Gong Forecast product to market. So I know a lot about the challenges the market's facing and um, more specifically, a lot about how Gong is helping our customers. So excited to chat. All right. Well, thank you so much um, for joining us, Samantha. And again, another expert um, and is on the front lines of forecasting um, and, and excited to hear about how you uh, leverage Gong as well. So let's get into the questions um, for the roundtable discussion. Um, and so the first question is around struggles and pain points that you've had. So historically, what were some of the biggest struggles and pain points that you've experienced with forecasting? And then how did you improve and overcome these challenges? So Dan, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really obvious, but I think my mind just goes to knowledge gaps behind um, the expectations around forecasting. Uh, and that's become more and more important as the organization that I've been responsible for has grown. So um, especially in the SaaS world, people come and go all the time. And there is often not a ton of effort put behind forecasting methodology. There's a lot of effort put behind where to forecast and what the forecast is, but not um, investment in properly defining stages and expectations. So that's one of the biggest struggles that I've had, which is when new leaders come into the business, they have a different type of way to forecast. And if the forecasting methodology isn't written down, we are leaving it to each individual's interpretation of, of what that means. So in practice, uh, I've seen this um, lead into when it's a fast moving product, what to do with those opportunities that enter your pipeline within the period that you're forecasting for. So like if your average close of an op is less than 30 days and you forecast on a quarterly basis, some people are forecasting based on historical trends on what will enter the pipeline. Some people are forecasting based on what's in Salesforce or your CRM because that's what they have visibility into. And without a proper methodology, you just have garbage in and it means your forecast is is garbage. So spending the time up front so that everyone is crystal clear on your methodology, entry and exit criteria for stages and roles and responsibilities where the IC's role starts and ends and where the manager's role starts and ends. Those are some of the biggest struggles that I've seen uh, because you end up with a forecast that you can't trust at all. And then you have to make decisions that are almost ignoring the numbers that are put in front of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great insights. Thank you, Dan. Um, and so, Chuck, would love to hear from you, especially from an enablement lens and how you've worked with other leaders in delivering forecasts. You know, as, as a seller and as a sales leader, it was always a struggle. Um, and I want to put a lens on it in that I've been working with SaaS mainly geared towards um, B2B and then more towards the enterprise side. And one of the things that I always teach sellers uh, that I learned the hard way, it's not so much that we're selling as our buyer is buying. And in order to be able to forecast well, 
you have to shift away from getting enamored and get happy years with your sales process because our process it's artificial it's it's what we do and what we have to do is develop a checklist and and a, and attune to what the buyer is doing and what they're saying and if we're not developing checklists on what the buyer behaviors are we're going to miss the forecast every time so when i go into and and work with sellers it's Okay, how do we get over our happy years? Because, oh, they've they've gotten to, they've taken a proposal. Yay, they've taken a proposal. Well, how many of you have gone shopping and said, well, how much does it cost? Well, send that to me. Does that mean that you're ready to buy? Well, no, that just means that you want to know how much it is because you're thinking about it. You're at the early stage. You're, you're learning. It doesn't mean that you're at the selection process. Um, we should be asking such things as, you know, who's on the spying committee? Have you developed your criteria? Have you agreed that this is a problem that you're willing to solve? Have you agreed that this is the solution that the buying committee wants? If you're not hitting those things, then you're not ready to forecast those things, no matter what stage you artificially think you are within your selling process. And by changing those things around and really go through and saying, okay, what are the buyer's behaviors that have to be happening and for them to be able to buy and really thinking and putting your buyer's hat on and developing that checklist for your organization on what your buyer goes through in order to be able, what is the normal buying behaviors that has to happen in order for them to close? And then saying, all right, have we checked enough of these on that we're confident that they're going to make a decision within the time frame that we feel comfortable that this is gonna come in and we can forecast that? Then we, we get a much clearer and more accurate forecast. And when we changed that dynamic in how we were talking as a leadership team, our forecast became really uh, a lot more tenable. The other thing that I was talking to one of my counterparts recently, they put a number and started to track how many times the uh, close date on a deal shift. Mm. And if the close date was changed more than a couple of times, that that deal was never put more than 50% forecastable. Because if the rep keeps kicking the end date down and down and down, they have no idea what's going on in that deal. Then it's a guess. Then that's in the nice to have column, not in the I can count on it column. So it's developing metrics and it's developing, yeah, the dreaded push count. I like that, Elizabeth, exactly. It's, it's on those things that can we as leaders develop, you know, understand the buying behaviors of our customers? And can we also understand the selling behaviors of our sellers and build those things in and understand both sides in order to be able to put a number up that our leadership can be confident in? Yeah, yeah. A lot of what um, Dan and, and Chuck, you both said really resonate with a lot of, you know, some of the things that we have seen. So um, to your point, Dan, and, and having a methodology, um, one of the traps that we've seen um, revenue leaders fall into is that you follow a methodology, let's just say medic as an example, um, and a rep will have all of medic filled out. And at, because they know medic, they think that they're very far along in the sales cycle. But to your point, Chuck, like where is the buyer? And so we need to make sure that we're not advancing our sales cycle just because we've checked our admin boxes and we've checked our medic or whatever uh, methodology that you're using, um, but really aligning it and meeting where the buyer, where they are in the journey. So that's one of the things that we see with the um, inflated uh, pipeline, which then ends up, you know, translating into um, forecasts that are, are inaccurate. And um, I love the term happy years. If you don't mind, I'm going to start using that. <laughs> I often say that some of the most optimistic um, people in the world are sales reps, um, but realism is better than optimism when it comes to uh, to forecasting. So um, thanks for thanks for those uh, those uh, two insights. So Pete, um, I'll I'll hand it over to you um, to get your take. Yeah, I I totally agree with Dan and Chuck. I think the the two things they mentioned, general just execution event against stage criteria and exit criteria and whatnot, is foundational irregardless of what technology you're using. Like if we are not accomplishing those things, it doesn't matter what systems we submit in or use to analyze the information. And I think to Chuck's point as well, right? We have to understand both sides of the story. We have to understand the seller behaviors that need to take place and more importantly, the buyer behaviors and milestones that they need to reach in order for us to be able to forecast accurately. So I just wanna double down on those two points as I think they're mission critical again, regardless of the technology. 
I think one of the pains that that I've experienced over the years is uh, historically a lot of forecasting has been based on anecdotal information that is either coming from the reps or us as leaders, right? It's it's filling in medic based on things you thought you heard, or it's giving your manager the best version of the news when they're asking you to identify the pain within the opportunity. And albeit some reps are really good listeners and so are managers at scale as you go from one rep to a manager, to a director, to a VP, to the C-suite, any errors that are based on anecdotal information can significantly add up at scale. And so where revenue intelligence and Gong in particular has come in as a, as a, as a stopgap against that is we no longer forecast based on anecdotal information that reps have to manually input. Like, yes, there is a, a an input layer per se, but we as leaders can go in and see exactly what is being said in the conversations, what is being said via email. Uh, we can surface risk and rely on the fact that it was said verbatim and it wasn't lost in a rep that was taking a call in their car when they were driving to get some pizza late night. Right. So uh, I think we're in a much better position today to no longer rely on uh, anecdotal and, and word of mouth. Uh, we're in a position to leverage technology to really understand what is taking place in the mission critical moments to ensure we're in the right stages and, and understand the seller behavior. Yeah. Um, yeah, I fully agree. The anecdotal um, information and that biasness that can creep in, um, having tools that you can, you know, go in and get the context directly is is so powerful. Um, and I wish I had that, you know, 15 years ago when I was starting out. Um, so Samantha, um, we'd love to hear from, from you, uh, your perspective. Yeah, I think from an end user perspective, I have slightly different challenges. A lot of what I was doing before using Gong Forecast was jumping into many different systems. And when you think about rep capacity and efficiency, um, a lot of folks in my position are becoming burdened with the amount of systems we need to update to have a clear picture of the forecast. So I was going into Clary to update my call, jumping into Salesforce to update numbers, going into Gong to check the context of my deals. And so it was taking me 30 minutes to update my forecast once a week. So I, I feel like having a centralized system with context really helps me from an efficiency standpoint. And then also when I'm talking with my manager on a one-on-one, -on -one, there's a lot more structure to it because we can see what's going on. There's no gaps in knowledge. We're able to take it from a what was initially a fact-finding mission to a strategizing session. That's great. Um, I really like how you put that, um, the fact-finding session um, and, and really being able to focus on the strategy. So that's great. Um, all right. Um, so thanks for that. Um, Indu, I know that there was a question that you had around um, what, well, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. To come. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. I think just perspectives were really great on that question as well. So Samantha, for example, I think we see a lot of this from a leadership perspective, but when we think about the silos that are being created, when you use multiple systems to update something like a forecast, that is a huge barrier. So thanks for pointing that out. I guess, given everyone's experience here, when it comes to forecasting, what is something you wish you knew years before or had done years before that you do today? I think like for me, um, there's a big focus on sales craft in sales in general. And so that's where a lot of managers spend time with their reps. And I think what that leads to is that people are trying to choose the right words and do all of these things and they don't lean on data enough. So one of the things that I'm like a broker and record is about people always come to me and tell me their feelings. I feel like we're missing this opportunity. I feel like this is an underrepresented things. And I was like, okay, good feelings, but tell me the facts. Like when we reach this stage for the last 100 deals that have gotten here, what is our likelihood to close? How long would it take? And like mapping what a great deal looks like, because then you know when things are going sideways. So if you know that your average days per stage is 30, and you've got an op sitting at 80 days in that same stage, you know something's up, right? That is a clear indicator that some something has gone off the rails. And that's what I love some of these automated tools like Gong for is that they take away some of your burden of finding those key pieces of information and surface them up to you. Um, like they'll prompt me if there are deals at risk because they've been sitting in stages too long, or you can automate that with your CRM or things like that. But then when you really do lean into data, you can start taking some of the emotion out of the forecast by just saying, okay, based on all of the deals we've closed, 
you've got this sitting at this stage with a close date of two weeks from now, our model would put that at a 4% likelihood to close in that time based on the number of things that need to happen between then and now. So what makes you so confident about this op? And people generally realize, oh yeah, I, I am less so, or those happy years um, existed because they listen, they heard what they wanted to hear, which was the customer saying that they wanted to make a decision by such and such a date, rather than informing that customer of all of the steps that needed to happen in order to make that decision by that date. So data is key and uh, facts over feelings every day. Yes, I could not agree more, kind of going to Chuck's point about happy ears. I think the data really gives you the barometer to really gauge if an opportunity is truly strong, if it's something we forecast within the quarter without having sort of that narrative or bias interjected. Uh, Chuck, what would you say on what you wish you had known prior to today? I, I think, you know, one of my favorite sayings from one of my mentors was hearsay is not admissible in the court of sales. If you have not heard them explicitly say it, you do not know it. And before the call, for those of you who just joined on, um, I was telling uh, Pete that uh, I was one of Gong's first 10 customers once upon a time. And I've been had conversational intelligence a lot the last uh, five companies I've had the opportunity to work for over the last 10 years. And one of the things that I've learned is that having conversational intelligence, whether it's Gong or one of the other tools, and I've had the opportunity to work with one or two of the other tools over the time, is that we have now the capacity to hear it from the customer's own voice. And if we as a leadership team are not cluing into smart trackers or the tools that are, in, are built into these things to start listening to the customers, how many, how, you know, for example, we know that it takes in uh, enterprise that it's gonna be six to eight buyers that are gonna be in every deal. And if we know that we're not getting at least three people to show up in the later stages of the deal on some form of the call, that call, that deals in suspect. Rarely do we have one single channel. And the systems now, Gong I love was on the last uh, company that I worked with. It would tell us, hey, you only, you're single threaded. Um, this deal, you may say it's on the forecast, but hey, you can't, you're not getting more than one person on it. And you could go through and see, you could hear it in the calls, you could see it in the email threads and it showed explicitly. So we could go back to the, the seller and say, I, do you really have this? Well, they say, well, show me where they said that. And you take more of a deeper dive inspection. I wish as a seller and as a sales leader, I had access to these tools to build the smart trackers, to build those things that we know inherently as a sales leadership team, we have to see and we have to hear in order for it to truly be a closing deal. I love that. And I think, Chuck, when you say having it be sort of hearsay in a courtroom, it is exactly the tool gong is where you have a transcript of exactly what's happening. But instead of, you know, dealing with that process that's not scalable, something like gong really makes it easy to understand what's being said and where those warnings surface in terms of if you're multi-threaded or if there are any other warnings that are really popping up. Um, Pete, what would you say? I'll actually give some give some guidance uh, outside of technology in general. Um, I think if I could go back in time and done sooner in my forecasting efforts, I think establishing the operating rhythm and the expectations for forecasting is mission critical. Uh, when you are dealing with a, a, a large organization or even a smaller one, uh, again, going to how things scale upwards, you need the reps, the managers, the directors, the VPs, et cetera, forecasting in the exact same motion uh, on, a, on a relatively predictable basis. And so I think if I look back in time, uh, how we forecasted and when we forecasted and how different teams forecasted, it was all very muddled. And there wasn't a clear way of doing things where you could uh, put a brown paper bag on somebody and they'd forecast the same way as somebody else, right? Or you could switch teams and it would feel the same. And so I think establishing that and having a moment where you outline exactly what the meetings are, what the expectations are, who's responsible for what and when uh, is going to really help drive predictability and uh, something as business leaders you can really trust on and rely on. Uh, I think the second piece of that is, is just having a general conversation around accountability. I think oftentimes as business leaders, we take on the burden of the forecast 
And we somewhat can shelter individual contributors from feeling that it is a very important part of their job that they are highly accountable to. And so that accountability conversation usually, look, usually looks like talking about mutual accountability, how you as a business leader are accountable to their forecast and them as an individual contributor or a frontline manager are just as accountable to what you're forecasting as well. And I think if you don't do those two things really well, people are bought in and understand the importance of what you're trying to do. And they can find peace of mind in the fact that they know how to do it, when to do it, uh, and who's counting on them to do so. So that's which, what I wish I'd done earlier is just get a bit more organized and uh, share the burden per se. Yeah. I love that point about sharing the burden. I know it's a conversation we've had a lot internally where a lot of times forecasting is we get a projection from an IC, take 15% off. And then after you, as you go up the ladder, that number changes a bit. But it really is important to have that accountability down to the IC level to really be able to know what's happening on the front lines. Samantha, what are your thoughts? What do you wish you had known sooner or done sooner when it comes to forecasting? Yeah, I definitely think just having like more structure around my forecast reviews. I know I said earlier, um, it was a fact-finding mission of, hey, where are we at in this deal and X, Y, and Z? And it really took up a lot of room for my manager and, and me being able to strategize in a deal. And so I really wish we had more space for that. I come into one-on-ones now and he knows exactly where I'm at and we're able to work across strategy across many more deals because he's caught up to speed. So I think just a little bit more structure and then also empowering my manager to be caught up to speed with my deal so he can better align with me. That's great. And you hit the nail right on the head there. When you think of something like a pipeline review or a one-on-one, -on -one, a majority of that should be strategizing. We have all the technology in place to actually capture where a deal stands. So if we have a scientific view of that, it really should be spent strategizing and trying to move the deal forward. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Liz for the next question. Yeah. Um, and before we get to the next question, um, just one thing I want to add from a CS and a renewal lens as well is the context um, that tools like Gong can provide um, is a game changer. So, you know, when I think back 10 years ago or so um, and, you know, trying to uh, do churn forecasting, um, having the right context was sometimes difficult. So yes, I can see through the CRM and email exchanges that there was engagement with a client. Um, however, you didn't always have the context of the quality of the engagement and what topics were being talked about. Um, so yes, you could look at success plans and all of those types of things, but really, again, that context, that realism, the facts versus the feelings, to your point earlier, Dan, um, and really understanding, are we driving the right conversations to make sure that this customer is in a position where we will have a successful renewal? Um, and then in addition to that, um, are we thinking about this before that 90 day time frame? And so if we look and see, okay, an executive is only engaged in the last 90 days um, and our renewal is in 90 days, that's actually a sign that potentially that's about to churn because they might be reevaluating their tool stack, which has been happening a lot this past year, um, where historically you might get that, you know, sort of false positive that an executive, oh, is engaged, you know, that's great. That increases the health score. But now with tools like Gong, we can actually see the reality of what that executive engagement is, what that means and get a more holistic picture. And so for me, that's a game changer um, for predicting churn. Um, so, so yeah, we'll move on to the next question. Um, and so I think we touched a little bit on, on, um, some of this on, in the previous question, but, um, we'd like to talk about how Gong specifically has helped in your forecasting efforts. Um, so if there's anything, um, you know, where you can look and say, all right, I can't imagine living, um, and doing forecasting without Gong at this point, um, would love to hear those, those, uh, uh, anecdotes and, um, tips from you. So Dan, we'll go back to you. Yeah, for sure. Um, Gong, as well as a couple of other things, have helped me eliminate forecasting calls, which are the worst call in the world. When you get your whole sales force together to talk about the numbers that everyone has access to and guilt them into upping their forecast, like it's the worst use of time that any company can do. And why Gong has helped me eliminate forecast calls is that you as a leader can be in lots of places at once with Gong. 
Like you don't have to live by that anecdotal feedback. And I've incorporated it into how I coach reps and how I run one-on-one -on -one meetings. Because my expectation is that if people are looking for feedback on any of the opportunities that they're working, they're being proactive and they're, they're adding me in the call itself, looking for coaching feedback or content. Um, it also allows me to dive into those really large opportunities that are the big swings of our forecast and spend less time with a bunch of people talking about those opportunities because every minute that you're spending is now strategizing rather than context. You can gain all context async and you're only focused on solving the problem rather than understanding it because you've literally got everything you need within Gong to do that. Um, so, I mean, I think like it, it eliminates the bias and allows managers to be in more places at once. And um, it, it gets rid of those expensive meetings and means that the time that you are spending together is focused on solutioning exclusively rather than getting up to speed, which is a thing that I hate to do. Mm, love it. Um, yeah, it definitely can improve an operational rhythm um, to your point. Those meetings are expensive and then the time that you do spend is is more productive and strategic. So um, those are great. So Jack, over to you, what, um, what would you add to that? Yeah, the, you know, the, the fabulous thing about Gong is the ability to, it's, it has a section that's designed to see the deals and the deals that are for that are set to close in a specific quarter. They do have their forecast module, which you can manage your forecasting in, but you don't have to have the forecast module. I'm sorry, Samantha, I know that you folks want to sell that, that module. It's a great module. I love it, but you don't have to have it. The native Gong application has, you know, set up so that you can see the deals that are in that quarter. And it has the, the elements to be able to say, here are the warnings. Here are the key warnings and you can build out the warnings, but the ability to also put smart trackers in. And I found that when we as an organization started to build the smart trackers out towards our uh, deal review methodology, we're, we've been a winning by design shop and used the SPICE methodology. And we started to put those trackers in and started to look at those deals that were set to close in a specific quarter and started to dig a little bit deeper and look at the trackers in and cross. Then we had much richer um, calls prior to the forecast or the pipe call. And we knew the deals that, especially the big ones on the enterprise size, you know, the six figure deals, are they coming or not? And we could grade, do we have the champion? You know, do we understand the situation? What was the identical pain, identified pain? And we weren't doing again, back to, if they didn't say it, we don't know it. So show me where it was set. And that changed the culture and that, that honed in the forecast, even in these difficult times. Um, whether you use Medic, whether you use Spice, it really doesn't matter. The tool itself allows you to build in the right process to have that checklist. If you don't, if anything, you're walking away from here. As an enablement professional, I would say you have to develop a checklist um, mm -hmm. and have those things. These are the things we have to see and hear from our customers to know that they are taking the steps on their side to truly make and execute a decision. Yeah, those are great. Um, yeah, and and really how the warnings that you mentioned, like those can be, um, uh, you know, huge in terms of zoning in and narrowing in very quickly on on the right things to focus on um, and taking methodologies regardless of what it is um, and really making it effective and part of the day to day and, and making sure that it's, you know, not just fields in a CRM, but something that's really going to guide um, the field into, um, you know, to their day to day and, and how they manage renewals or, or um, sales deals. So um, that's great. Thank you, Chuck. Um, so Pete, what would you add to that? Sorry, I, Elizabeth, I was just going to jump in because Chuck said something that really resonated with me on the CS side of things. And yeah, it's go ahead. Smart trackers. Uh, when we expanded the scope of our CS team's role to be growing into selling our platform rather than being focused on a single product, what we heard from the field was like there was no appetite for these new products. But what we found out when we set up some of these smart trackers that Chuck mentioned in Gong was that they just weren't even bringing up the topic because they were already feeling shaky about that customer's ability to renew, that they were terrified to add scope to the conversation. So it meant that the thing we were hearing from the field and what was happening in reality was totally different. And 
by exposing that, we could dig into what the challenges were and change our strategy so that um, we actually got that new product into the conversations. And kind of after that moment, we saw an explosion in pipeline generated from that product um, because it wasn't, <laughs> people just didn't know about it. It wasn't that uh, it wasn't resonating. Awesome. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, that's really helpful from the, the CS lens and certainly not the first time that I've heard, you know, sort of that that dynamic as well. So um, Pete, um, I'll hand it over to you to, to go next. Yeah, I mean, if anyone eats their own dog food, it's us here at Gong. So <laughs> uh, I, I think the headline is uh, Gong's enabled us to, to get way more accurate and more strategic with our forecast. We are at the point where we are within a 5% delta of the call each and every month, each and every quarter, which is uh, what we have believe to be world-class. And there's a couple of different ways we get there. Uh, I think to everybody's point on this call, there is still a bottoms-up forecast where there is an analysis of the deals and what is taking place in the deals, whether you use Medic or Spiced or whatever your methodology may be to roll up a number. But there is also a top-down component that is built on top of AI that we can gut check the bottoms up forecast against with a top-down analysis based on time left in quarter, pipeline coverage, historical win rates, but most importantly, what is taking place in the conversations. So our analysis is not just based on uh, black and white CRM information, like someone sent you an email or someone took a call or something like that. We actually analyze the context of each interaction, email, phone call, Zoom call, you name it. And if there is risk in that interaction, we surface it and we decrease the score applied to that deal. So when you combine those two things, when you when you can rely on uh, the best AI out there and you can rely on, on reps and managers and leaders that are trained on how to run a really good bottoms up forecast, those two things come together to make you really, really accurate and gets you to that 95, 96%. I think on the strategic side of things, our managers are, are showing up in a big way. They're not going to the forecast meeting and saying, what's the best version of the news? They've done their homework and they've identified risk and areas where they need to go coach to, to drive deals forward, to improve the forecast. So uh, I'd say those are two, the two biggest things that Gong's enabled us to do here. Yeah. And I would definitely say 95, 96, that is world-class um, and being able to dig in at the activity level and see those red flags really quickly um, can make a huge difference. And then, you know, that provides the ability to coach the reps as well as, uh, um, you know, in terms of where they need the coaching. Um, so Samantha, speaking of eating your own dog food, as uh, uh, Pete said, I um, would love to hear your thoughts as well. Yeah, I think uh, for forecasting efforts, I'm just spending time and the right deals and taking the right actions to move them along. I'm able to quickly see which of my deals are at risk or have significant gaps to close. So from a seller's perspective, I can just be better with my time. I don't have all of the time in the world. And I think another intangible aspect of Gong forecast or Gong in general is just CRM hygiene. So I'm not, you know, getting things from sales ops or leaders about updating stages or dates because I can see everything like activity wise, momentum wise in Gong forecast. I'm able to go in super quickly and update my calls um, every day versus the once a week where I used to have like, hey, update your forecast. So from a business perspective, right, like as an AE across the board, the better hygiene helps our rev ops team and managers as well create more predictability than before. Yeah. Yeah, we've often um, referred to Gong as the connective tissue across the organization. So from the front line to the executive team, because it provides that data, um, that visibility um, based on the, the data um, and data hygiene. I mean, um, what organization doesn't want data hygiene? So um, that's great. Thanks, everybody, for, for those tips. Those are really useful. Um, so, Indu, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, so I know we've all talked about some pretty good tips already about how we can forecast better. As you're thinking about the audience here and sort of those top two tips you'd give to them to really tactically take advantage of forecasting, what would those be? I guess one of them being non-Gong related and another maybe being a little bit more specific to Gong. Dan, we'll start off with you. Um, this one, I don't have the data to support, but I feel like deals that you your reps have a texting relationship with their primary contact have an 80% higher likelihood to close. So there should be like a texting relationship flag in your CRM because 
you can talk whatever you want about confidence scores, but if you're on a texting relationship, that proves that there is a relationship beyond the business one and they're gonna be feeding you real information. So um, would love to see any sort of research that backs up that feeling, but I am very certain of it. When it comes to Gong, um, spend a lot of time when you are first onboarding reps with their first few calls and specifically around their next steps, solicit their feedback as to why they put their next steps and listen to that call together and then talk it through. Talk about the things that you agree or disagree on and it will start highlighting both what you value in the forecast and give a clear understanding of your expectations on what to push on and what to probe on. Because if you spend a ton of time on that upfront, you don't have to spend time on that later because you'll be on the same page. So as soon as you onboard a rep, do that however many calls you want until the feedback they're giving you about the why behind their next steps and their process matches exactly what you think. Yeah, I love that. And it kind of goes back to the earlier point of understanding how buyers buy is critical, but also understanding how your sellers sell and how they're presenting information is so critical in forecasting and getting that accuracy correct. Chuck, what would you add to that? We'd go, we've talked about the checklist piece, but the one thing I would go back to is the, have you scripted out, have you sat down with your leaders and have you sat down with your sellers and set out what are the buyer behaviors that you need to see and hear to know that they've advanced to the next stage? We often put our own artificial exit criteria for the stages within our sales process, but have we also sat, especially when it gets down towards the forecasting, what do we need to see the buyer do, ask, or say in order to know that they've advanced in their buying process. Um, and it varies from company to company, but there are specific things that we should be gating on and having the rep, again, hearsay is not admissible in the court of sales, to see them do to know that it's advancing on their side. When we're clear on that, it's gonna become crystal clear on our side whether this deal really is progressing or not. And then when we look at the gong, gong is, is fantastic. I've, I'm a big fan of conversational intelligence to be that single sort of truth. Uh, you see CRMs like uh, Salesforce are great and it's just static data and you'll get numbers, but to be able to listen to the voice of the customer and get the intent and the tonality of what the customer is saying and have a process around going in and reviewing. All right, so what are we really hearing them say? How do we know that they're really making this decision or that they're bringing the other people that we need to have in as part of the buying party? And then their ability to bring in the emails and folks, I have helped numerous companies try to get Gong adopted. Gong, you guys are great on, on getting them, you know, giving the, the tool to somebody, but there's always that little onboarding process where there's the resistance of the reps to get it in or the leaders don't really use it. Once you finally get it on board and, and reps really understand the power of what it can do for them and they start to embrace it and make sure that their emails are coming in and make sure that all of their calls are recorded, whether it's not just the Zoom calls, but their audio calls are you know, also picked up on that thing. And they're using it religiously because it's really encompassing everything. Then you get the full spectrum to really know and it starts telling you things. And then the reps are going like, holy cow, this is cool. I didn't know it could do this. And then, then we really know the scope of what's happening. And it's not just us feeling, it's the system telling us because it's bringing back that quantifiable data and it's giving us the warnings we really need. But that doesn't happen without intent by the leaders and the sellers to fully embrace it. Absolutely. That buy-in is so critical. I think that whole what's in it for me angle from the rep level of, oh, I don't have to take notes furiously as I'm talking to this customer to now I can self-assess and really understand where the gaps are in my opportunity is huge in getting it really implemented and adopted. Um, Pete, what would you add on to that? I think a non-gong related tip would be uh, ha have some form of, of methodology that you rely on. Uh, it's very important that folks are speaking the same language and uh, there is consistency. So there's a ton out there. I won't recommend one in particular, but have some kind of a framework, some kind of a methodology that you are evaluating and forecasting based on. That's going to be mission critical, regardless of if you have technology or you're forecasting on a napkin. Uh, I think a tip with gong... Um, we typically go to market in the form of a pilot. And so if you are potentially interested in seeing some of these things in action with your own data, 
and, and testing adoption and your ability to run a really effective pipeline and or forecast meeting. Uh, I'd encourage you to get in touch and uh, we can potentially set you up with a pilot instance to see it in action. Because I think a lot of companies find themselves at, at different journeys on the uh, digital transformation life cycle, whereas no one's ever done call recording, no one's ever heard of CI, right? Like that's that's a lot of just change management and things that we can work through, but we still do some form of a pilot. Or you may have used every tech in the world, you just haven't used the right one. And uh, we can come in and potentially validate if Gong is the right one for that. So my general tip is if you've got an opportunity and you're thinking about it and you wanna use something such as Gong to, to improve your forecast, um, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the opportunity to try it. Great. And Samantha, anything to add from a tips perspective? Well, first of all, I second the tryout gong piece. I can't imagine being a leader and not having that visibility. I would say from a general tip perspective, as a rep, I always encourage people to be your harshest critic and skeptic with deals. Um, poke holes in your deals as if you are your own manager and then come prepared to your pipeline reviews with a solution. Um, be as organized as possible, have a plan for any scenario and how it turns out. And I would say with Gong specifically, if you are using Gong and you're only listening it for call recording, you're missing out on the value of our deal boards. So spend some time, learn how you can start to marry conversational data with CRM data, because those two are intertwined and they depend on each other. So I would just say adopt more of our product because that's where a ton of the value is for revenue leaders. Yeah, I would second that as well. When we're working with our clients and they have their deal boards up and running, we move faster, um, you know, when we're, we're helping our clients. So um, definitely second that as well. <laughs> All right. Um, so we have about uh, seven minutes left and we had a couple of um, Q&A um, from the audience that were submitted. Um, so we'll go to those questions um, and then we will uh, wrap up. Um, but the first question that we had was, have you been able to prove whether there is a positive ROI for purchasing and using Gong forecasting? Um, but we'll say Gong in general as well. Um, so Dan, uh, what are your thoughts there? Um, to be honest, I've never sat down to analyze the true ROI because it became clear so quickly how little we knew about the opportunity before we used tools like Gong. And so if you were to remove it now, um, the amount of time it would take reps to get up to speed or for my leaders to gain insight into what is going on is just so immense that like, I couldn't really consider running a sales organization without a tool like it. The only way you could if you wanted to really know what was happening is if you're on every deal and if you have the ability to do that, great. Uh, but if not, you need something to allow you to be in more than one place. So um, I think if you try it and then took it away, it would be one of those things that you'd be like, well, uh, it's like my car. Like I've never done an ROI analysis on having a car. I know that I can't live without it. So I don't really need to worry about it. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to imagine living without it. And um, I would say the same thing for customer success teams as well. Um, same applies there. Um, so Chuck, uh, what are what are your thoughts on the, the ROI that you've seen? Oh, you're on mute. There. Sorry, I muted myself on a cough and it, it stuck me in the mute zone. Okay. Um, the... The ROI, it's it's one of those things that you've got to have that before and after, so it's very hard. Most people, when they uh, implement Gong, that it's it's a soft ROI saying, "Hey, you know, before this we had no idea of the visibility, and now we have visibility, and look at us go now." Um, but I'm very passionate about having conversational intelligence in some form. I, I can't imagine going into a uh, company these days without having it. I, as an enablement professional. I insist that you have a CRM, a call intelligence, and some sort of sequencing tool. Otherwise, in this modern day of selling, I, I don't know how you do that. Um, because how do you track, how do you measure, how do you manage, and how do you improve if you don't have something that you can hear the voice of the customer and really hear and see what's happening with it um, so that you can iterate on it and make it better? 
So um, I'd be interested in Gong from their perspective on what they've seen from hard numbers, because I don't think a lot of us on the enablement side have had numbers beforehand and say, now that we put this tool in, what that's turned around. But I know that it's made a world of difference in our ability to be effective and efficient as enablement professionals, because now we have the ability to coach specifically on what's happening in the field. And it allows us to be far more relevant because now I've gone from saying, hey, here are the best practices to say, here's what's uh, here's what the process is. Now let's do um, film reviews and let's go to what the customers are saying and see how it's being applied. Change the whole dynamic. Great. All right, so Pete, uh, over to you. Yeah, um, we, we have a lot of published case studies on, on companies we've been able to help, such as Upwork, and taking them from 40% accuracy to upwards of 90%. And that's just one example, right? Like we can send links out to those if everybody's interested. Uh, we also have just general benchmarking data based on the aggregate of all users within Gong, which is really interesting. And we're figuring out a way to communicate that to the market as some of it's a bit proprietary right now. But more to come, I'll leave you with a teaser there. I think I'll go back to my last point, though. If, if ROI is something that is very important to the company and, and proving the value of the investment, I would, again, encourage you to potentially trial Gong because we can show you with your data where the sore spots are. We can show you with your data how much more efficient your managers can actually be in coaching and driving pipeline and driving an accurate forecast. And you can see for yourself. Uh, I, I always joke with reps that case studies are an excuse for something else that's going on within the deal. And if you've got an opportunity to use your own data to make an educated decision based on leading indicators that you can see within a period of time, great. CFO, whoever's approving that is going to believe that a whole lot more than you know the other wonderful companies that we, we've been able to help. So uh, I'll leave you with that, but plenty, plenty of data. We got, we got too much data. And yeah. a teacher, apparently. <laughs> Yeah. I love I it. Often, people often think too big when they come to ROI and then you get into, well, we're doing lots of stuff. I, I would maybe go back to that forecast call. If you are having a meeting with highly paid salespeople for one hour a week, that meeting probably costs you a thousand dollars a week. So if you can get rid of that, that's a pretty easy way to eliminate a huge amount of cost from your books and put that into a tool like Gong. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I 100% agree with you, Dan. Um, so Samantha, uh, what are what are your thoughts on the ROI? <laughs> yeah, I think ROI is really interesting because there's often a tangible number for it. But in working and selling over 100 forecast deals, the true ROI I've seen is it less tangible. It's better resource allocation. Can you hire these amount of people? Should you invest in this product or that product? Um, what does future pipeline look like? Can you roll this up to the board? Are you able to secure this specific series funding at this valuation? So there's so much more beyond a number. I think from a sales perspective, if you're to zoom in on the front lines, can you save a few more deals in quarter because you're aware of risks in your forecast um, versus the lagging indicators? So I'd say there's like a higher level business metric and then also the individual saving more deal metric for ROI. Okay. Great. Um, that's helpful. So um, we only have a couple of minutes left and one more question. Um, and uh, maybe we'll challenge you all to answer it in 30 seconds or less, because I'm sure you all have uh, other meetings and calls to get to. Um, but the last question is around um, what has been the time saved by implementing um, these forecasting tips? So if you could, you know, even estimate how much time you were spending before um, and what you're spending now, what would that be? So Dan, we'll I'll start with you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean, um, I hate to go back to the same thing, but I mean, <laughs> the weekly forecast call from all of my reps calendar and my own. Um, so depending on your sales team, that's a pretty big uh, elimination of time. Yeah, take that times however many reps you have, and that's that's significant. Um, Chuck, what's your perspective? I think that. Time is not the currency, but accuracy is the currency. And by implementing these tips, we've gotten better accuracy from the reps um, so that they feel more confident in the number that they're giving and management feels more confident in the number. And I think that's more important than the actual you know, ticks on the clock. Okay, great perspective. Thank you. Um, and Pete, your thoughts? Chuck's got some great quotes. I need to stay <laughs> Yeah, I agree. 
<laughs> uh, it's anecdotal, but I would say I'm spending about half the time that I used to on my forecast as compared to previous places that I've worked and uh, other time that's been allocated towards it. Wow. Half is a lot. Think of what else you could be doing if you could have half of that time back. So that's, that's significant. Um, Samantha, uh, what's your experience with the, with it? Yeah, we actually surveyed our forecast customers and we saw a 56% reduction in manual forecasting efforts. So Pete's pretty spot on um, with that. Wow, that's that's amazing. Okay, well, I think that's actually a really great um, <laughs> tidbit to end on. Um, 56%, that is that is really significant. Who doesn't want that much time back? Um, and, and think of how you can spend that with your customers and, and with your opportunities. Um, so on that note, I wanna thank um, the panelists um, and everybody for joining us today. Um, I learned a lot um, and really uh, appreciate you sharing your insight and the experiences that you've had. Um, and we will be sharing the recording um, of this with everybody. So you'll be able to rewatch um, because Chuck's one-liners are <laughs> fantastic as well as everyone's um, experiences and tips that they have provided. Um, so again, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, hopefully we will all connect again soon. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Appreciate the time.